Alleluia. Christ is risen. The Lord is risen indeed. Hallelujah. Good morning and welcome. And a special welcome to those visiting with us this morning or those who are watching online. Our service begins, or continues, I should say, on page 355 of the Book of Common Prayer. Saying together, Almighty God, to you all hearts are open, all desires known, and from you no secrets are hid. Cleanse the thoughts of our hearts by the inspiration of the Holy Spirit, that we may perfectly love you and worthily magnify your holy name through Christ our Lord. Amen. God, whose blessed Son made himself known to his disciples in the breaking of bread, open the eyes of our faith that we may behold him in all his redeeming work, who lives and reigns with you in the unity of the Holy Spirit, one God, now and forever. Amen. Amen. A reading from the Acts of the Apostles. Peter addressed the people, you Israelites, why do you wonder at this? Or why do you stare at us? As though by our own power or piety we made him walk. The God of Abraham, the God of Isaac, and the God of Jacob, the God of our ancestors has glorified his servant Jesus, whom you handed over and rejected in the presence of Pilate, though he had decided to release him. But you rejected the Holy and Righteous One and asked to have a murderer given to you. And you killed the author of life, whom God raised from the dead. To this we are witnesses. And by faith in his name, his name itself has made this man strong. Whom you see and know, and the faith that is through Jesus has given him this perfect health in the presence of all of you. And now, friends, I know that you acted in ignorance as did also your rulers. In this way, God fulfilled what he had foretold through all the prophets, that his Messiah would suffer. Repent, therefore, and turn to God so that your sins may be wiped out. The word of the Lord.
A reading from the first letter of John. See what love the Father has given us, that we should be called the children of God, and that is what we are. The reason the world does not know us is that it did not know him. Beloved, we are God's children now. What we will be has not yet been revealed. What we do know is this, when he is revealed, we will be like him, for we will see him as he is. And all who have this hope in him purify themselves, just as he is pure. Everyone who commits sin is guilty of lawlessness. Sin is lawlessness. You know that he was revealed to take away sins, and in him there is no sin. No one who abides in him sins. No one who sins has either seen him or known him. Little children, let no one deceive you. Everyone who does what is right is righteous, just as he is righteous. The word of the Lord. of our Lord and Savior Jesus Christ according to Luke. Glory to you, Lord Christ. While the disciples were telling how they had seen Jesus risen from the dead, Jesus himself stood among them and said to them, Peace be with you. They were startled and terrified and thought that they were seeing a ghost. He said to them, Why are you frightened? And why do doubts arise in your hearts? Look at my hands and my feet. See that it is I myself. Touch me and see, for a ghost does not have flesh and bones as you see that I have. And when he had said this, he showed them his hands and his feet. While in their joy they were disbelieving and still wondering, he said to them, Have you anything here to eat? And they gave him a piece of broiled fish, and he took it and ate in their presence. Then he said to them, These are my words that I spoke to you while I was still with you, that everything written about me in the law of Moses, the prophets, and the Psalms must be fulfilled. Then he opened their minds to understand the scriptures, 
And he said to them, Thus it is written, that the Messiah is to suffer and to rise from the dead on the third day, and that repentance and forgiveness of sins is to be proclaimed in his name to all nations, beginning from Jerusalem. You are witnesses of these things. The Gospel of the Lord. Praise to you, Lord Christ. May the words of my mouth and the meditations of our hearts be always acceptable in thy sight. O Lord, our strength and our Redeemer. Amen. I was visiting with some parishioners this week who told me about a unique Easter morning practice of the bishop that was in their church where they used to live. He would come running full speed down the aisle at the beginning of the service shouting, He is risen! Now, while it made me laugh as I imagined how the worship committee might react to this if I were to try and pull this off here at the church, this departure from the usual liturgical decorum, it also struck me as terribly appropriate given the news being proclaimed. He is risen. This is radically exciting news. We begin every service in the Easter season with this proclamation, He is risen. The Lord is risen indeed. Alleluia. Yet I wonder if it is news that we fail to receive with the impact it merits, in part because it has become part of the routine of our tradition. Have we lost sight of the wonder and the unexpectedly glorious nature of this announcement? Has this earth-shattering news that literally alters our reality become old news because we failed to realize its impact in our lives? Surely Mary must have sprinted from the tomb to go and tell the disciples and burst in the door shouting, He's risen! But instead of carrying forward the proclamation like runners in a relay shouting it from the rooftops, the disciples are huddled together in the upper room behind locked doors. Could it be that the news seemed just too good to be true? Could it be that hearing it from someone else wasn't enough to experience the truth of the resurrection as a personal reality. In a conversation I had with a candidate for the associate's position some time ago, this was one that got away, just to be clear, I had been telling him about all the great things going on in Macon, and in particular, all that God is doing here at Christ Church and how wonderful the people here are. And he was really getting excited about the possibility of coming to Macon. Then his wife went online, and she found the high murder rate and other things that made her have a very different reaction to the idea of coming to Macon. Now, he was a former journalist, and he reminded her that the media 
always leads with bad news. It's never the full or even the most accurate story. Why is that? Why is it so easy for us to accept unequivocally the bad news, while the good news is sometimes so hard to believe? We tend to want proof for the good news, where the bad news we swallow without question. It's a common expression to say, it's too good to be true. But you never hear anyone say, it's too bad to be true. I've often said truth is stranger than fiction. No matter how much scripture speaks of God's goodness, God's steadfast love and faithfulness, and no matter how often people bear witness to the truth of that in their own lives, it often seems just too hard to believe that God would redeem this fallen and sinful world. Sometimes our awareness of our own sins, those things we have done and left undone, make it a struggle to believe that God would forgive, love, and redeem us, redeem me. We've heard that God sent his only son, Jesus, to die on the cross for the forgiveness of our sins and to accomplish the victory over sin and death. But is that really something I am able to share in? It's one thing to hear about it and even to believe in my head that it's true, but it's another thing altogether to receive it and live into the reality of this truth in our own lives. The disciples were all too aware of their own failure. They had fled and abandoned Jesus to suffer and die alone. Only John and the women stayed with him, bearing witness to the horror of the crucifixion that he endured. In his hour of greatest need, the others had forsaken him. Surely as they were gathered in this upper room, in addition to their fear of the authorities and what they might do to them if they caught them, they were struggling with feelings of guilt and shame. Two of the disciples who were not among the twelve had seen Jesus. And while they were gathered in the upper room, they were, re- they were recounting to the others all that had happened when they saw him. They told how Jesus had walked alongside them on the road to Emmaus, unrecognized as they headed out of the city, discouraged and confused. They spoke of the way he had opened the scriptures to them, showing them how the prophets had foretold all that had happened. Even though their hearts burned within them as he spoke, they still had not recognized Jesus. It wasn't until he broke bread with them that they knew, and then he disappeared from their sight. They were discussing all of this, how God had acted through Jesus when Jesus appeared among them. When we are recounting to one another all that God is and all that God has done. In short, praising and thanking God together, we invite God's presence to come and be among us. This is what happened in that upper room when Jesus appeared to them in his resurrected body as they were discussing all that had happened on the road to Emmaus. But even then, when the disciples could see and hear and even touch Jesus for themselves, they couldn't quite believe 
the truth of the resurrection. It wasn't just Thomas who doubted. It was just too good to be true. It wasn't until Jesus asked them for something to eat and he ate with them that they believed he had risen from the dead. Why? First of all, a ghost doesn't eat. Jesus proved he was really flesh and blood by the simple act of consuming food which sustains life. Jesus had not come back to haunt them for their failures. He had come back to invite them to his table. Jesus used table fellowship, sharing a meal as a demonstration of the kingdom of God throughout his ministry. Ancient Jewish laws of hospitality were a sacred practice that honored God by providing hospitality to all those in need. It was required to offer hospitality even to your mortal enemy if they were in need. To accept the offer of hospitality was to accept reconciliation. When you sat at table with one another, it implied reconciliation. The host essentially became the servant of the guest and gave their very best, even risking their own life or the life of a family member if necessary to keep their guest from harm and providing their very best even if it meant that later they would be in want. By the time of Jesus, the practice had changed. The Jews had become very exclusive about who they shared a meal with. You would never share a meal with a non-Jew, a person of the streets, or certainly not with a notorious sinner. Table fellowship in the time of Jesus was essentially an exclusive boundary indicating who was inside and who was outside that boundary. Jesus not only disregarded that current practice, but he turned those standards on end. He made a practice of sharing meals with sinners. He practiced a hospitality and a table fellowship much more reminiscent of those ancient sacred practices that invited anyone in need to the table. And there they were welcomed and blessed and included. For Jesus, a meal was a way of inviting others to participate in himself and the kingdom of God that he had brought near. A kingdom of everlasting reconciliation between God and his people, his creation. This is a kingdom made possible by the grace and mercy of God. The parables that Jesus so often told spoke of bringing people in from the highways and the byways, of inviting the outsiders, those never invited, those who could not repay the favor. His table fellowship demonstrated the steadfast, unconditional, unfailing love of God. It didn't require that a person repent and reach a certain standard to be able to join Jesus at the table. Instead, the bar was removed altogether, and coming to the table with Jesus was itself the transformative event. His meals were not only inclusive, they were liberating. Eating with him changed a person. To eat with Jesus was to be freed of the shackles that society had placed on a person, keeping them trapped in their sins or making them always regarded as an outsider. To eat with Jesus was to be treated with honor and respect. He demonstrated mercy and grace. 
Holiness for Jesus was not a negative and excluding force, but a compelling, positive, inclusive force. He invited people into holiness rather than excluding them because of their unholiness. So you can see why the disciples who had failed Jesus so miserably were able to believe in the sharing of a meal. By eating with them, Jesus was not only showing them he was alive, he could eat, he was flesh and blood, but he was reconciling them to himself. He was inviting them into the kingdom of God in spite of their failures and their sins. At a Jewish table, the master of the house would say a blessing over the unbroken loaf of bread. Then everyone would take a piece of the broken bread as a demonstration that they were partaking not only in the bread, but in the blessing that had been said over it. It was the forming and celebrating of a mutual bond between the guests and the host. It created a sense of union among them. Is this sounding familiar? This breaking of bread together, sharing a meal together, became a hallmark of Jesus' ministry as so much of what he taught was conveyed and understood through this practice. In the upper room, when Jesus asked the disciples for something to eat, rather than himself being the one who functioned as the host, he was not only offering reconciliation, but he was showing them how they were to go forward in this ministry in his name they would become the hosts at his table, inviting everyone to come to God's table, to experience reconciliation with God through Jesus Christ, and to experience the blessings of his kingdom. But he would not be expecting them to carry out this ministry on their own. He would be sending the Holy Spirit to empower them, to be Christ within them as they ministered in his name. When Jesus appeared to them in the upper room, he demonstrated his real presence to them. He reconciled them to himself and to God, and he commissioned them for ministry with the promise of the Holy Spirit that was to come. This, like all other meals with Jesus, was transformative. They were changed from a fearful band of failed friends to a courageous band of apostles ready to receive the promise of the Father that would empower them to minister in Jesus' name. As we celebrate communion today, listen to the words of the Eucharistic prayer, the blessing said over the bread and the wine knowing that as you participate in this meal, you participate in the blessing. You are reconciled with God and have entered into this unique bond of fellowship and grace with Jesus Christ and with one another as you come to his transformative table. Amen. Let us stand and affirm our faith in the one who is indeed risen, as we say together the Nicene Creed found on page 358. We believe in one God, the Father, the Almighty, maker of heaven and earth, of all that is seen and unseen. We believe in one Lord, Jesus Christ, the only Son of God, eternally begotten of the Father, God from God, light from light, true God from true God, begotten, not made, 
of one being with the Father. Through him all things were made. For us and for our salvation, he came down from heaven. By the power of the Holy Spirit, he became incarnate from the Virgin Mary and was made man. For our sake, he was crucified under Pontius Pilate. He suffered death and was buried. On the third day, he rose again in accordance with the scriptures. He ascended into heaven and is seated at the right hand of the Father. He will come again in glory to judge the living and the dead, and his kingdom will have no end. We believe in the Holy Spirit, the Lord, the giver of life, who proceeds from the Father and the Son. With the Father and the Son, he is worshipped and glorified. He has spoken through the prophets. We believe in one holy Catholic and apostolic church. We acknowledge one baptism for the forgiveness of sins. We look for the resurrection of the dead and the life of the world to come. Amen. In peace we pray to you, Lord God. for all people in their daily life and work. For our families, friends, and neighbors, and for those who are For this community, the nation, and the world. For all who work for justice, freedom, and peace. For the just and proper use of your creation. For all who are in danger, sorrow, or any kind of trouble. For those who minister to the sick, the friendless, and the needy. For the peace and unity of the Church of God. For all who proclaim the gospel, and all who seek the truth. For Michael Curry, our presiding bishop, and Rob Wright, our bishop, and for all bishops and other ministers. For all who serve God and His church. For the special needs and concerns of this congregation, especially those on our parish prayer list, Angie, Ann, Bailey, Bill, Bonnie, Clay, Diane, Dixie, Ed, Eleanor, Elizabeth, Gary, George, Gibson, Gracie, Rabbi Greg, Griffin, Helen, Hughes, Jamie, Jerry, Jordan, Karen, Kelly, Ken, Libby, Lowe, Malcolm, Margaret, Markeisha, Mildred, Nancy, Pammy, Peggy, Pete, Phyllis, Susan, Stanley, Tommy, Tony, Tracy, and Tricia. Give them courage and hope in their troubles and bring them the joy of your salvation. We also pray for those serving in the military, especially Austin, Cameron, Charlie, Georgia, Joe, John, Rose, and Sam. Please add your own petitions, either silently or aloud. We pray for peace and reconciliation in the Holy Land. Hear us, Lord. We thank you, Lord, for all the blessings of this life. Please add your prayers of praise and thanksgivings. We will exalt you, O God, our King. And praise your name forever and ever. We remember this day, O Kenneth White, Betty White, and Hubert Addleton for whom the altar flowers are given in loving memory and to the glory of God. We pray for all who have died, that they may have a place in your eternal kingdom. Lord, let your loving kindness be upon them. Lord Jesus Christ, you said to your apostles, peace I give to you. 
My own peace I leave with you. Regard not our sins, but the faith of your church, and give to us the peace and unity of that heavenly city, where with the Father and the Holy Spirit you live and reign, now and forever. Amen. The peace of the Lord be always with you. A few brief announcements. I don't know if you have heard that there's a new men's Bible study that meets Thursday mornings at 7 o'clock in uh, the cloister room. They have bagels and cream cheese and coffee. Uh, but it's wonderfully growing, and it's people of all different ages. So if you have a fear of missing out, which I, I think might be appropriate in this case, then Please check out the men's Bible study that happens on Thursday mornings. Will McDavid is leading it. He's also actually leading our adult Sunday school right now uh, in a current class on Genesis, part two of his Genesis class. I don't know if you know, but Will has written a book on Genesis, so you might check out his Sunday school class. Um, also, Coral Evensong is coming up. Next Sunday, the 21st, um, the Young Parents Supper Club is also meeting at the end of the month. Uh, Vacation Bible School is coming up in June. That's a ways off, but I'm telling you now because Rachel would be happy to have anyone speak with her who would like to be part of the team that is a vast number of different kinds of volunteers um, to make that happen. So please speak with Rachel or with Hope if you would like to help. Also, this Tuesday night at 5.30 in Jones Chapel is our rooted service where we have um, many different instrumentalists leading a more informal style worship with uh, a different kind of music, and it's just a, a nice opportunity. So if you haven't checked that out in the chapel, please join us this Tuesday evening. Any other announcements? Walk in love as Christ loved us and gave himself for us, an offering and sacrifice to God.
service continues on page 361 in your prayer book. The Lord be with you. And also with you. Lift up your hearts. We give thanks to the Lord. Let us give thanks to the Lord our God. It is right to give him thanks and praise. It is right and a good and joyful thing, always and everywhere, to give thanks to you, Father Almighty creator of heaven and earth, that chiefly are we bound to praise you for the glorious resurrection of your Son, Jesus Christ, our Lord. For he is the true Paschal Lamb who was sacrificed for us and has taken away the sin of the world. By his death he has destroyed death, and by his rising to life again he has won for us everlasting life. Therefore, we praise you, joining our voices with angels and archangels and with all the company of heaven who forever sing this hymn to proclaim the glory of your name. Gracious Father, in your infinite love, you made us for yourself. And when we had fallen into sin and become subject to evil and death, you in your mercy sent Jesus Christ, your only and eternal Son, to share our human nature, to live and die as one of us, to reconcile us to you, the God and Father of all. He stretched out his arms upon the cross, and offered himself in obedience to your will, a perfect sacrifice for the whole world. On the night he was handed over to suffering and death, our Lord Jesus Christ took bread. And when he'd given thanks to you, he broke it and gave it to his disciples and said, Take, eat. This is my body which is given for you. Do this for the remembrance of me. After supper, he took the cup of wine, and when he'd given thanks, he gave it to them and said, Drink this, all of you. This is my blood of the new covenant, which is shed for you and for many for the forgiveness of sins. Whenever you drink it, do this for the remembrance of me. Therefore, we proclaim the mystery of faith, Christ has died, Christ is risen, Christ will come again. We celebrate the memorial of our redemption, O Father, in this sacrifice of praise and thanksgiving. Recalling his death, resurrection, and ascension, we offer you these gifts. Sanctify them by your Holy Spirit to be for your people the body and blood of your Son, the holy food and drink of new and unending life in him. Sanctify us also that we may faithfully receive this holy sacrament and serve you in unity, constancy, and peace. And at the last day, bring us with all your saints into the joy of your eternal kingdom. All this we ask through your Son, Jesus Christ, by him and with him and in him, in the unity of the Holy Spirit, all honor and glory is yours, Almighty Father, now and forever. Amen. Amen. And now, as our Savior Christ has taught us, we are bold to pray. Our Father, who art in heaven, 
hallowed be thy name. Thy kingdom come, thy will be done, on earth as it is in heaven. Give us this day our daily bread, and forgive us our trespasses, as we forgive those who trespass against us. And lead us not into temptation, but deliver us from evil. For thine is the kingdom, and the power, and the glory, forever and ever. Amen. Alleluia. Christ, our Passover, is sacrificed for us. Therefore, let us keep the feast. Alleluia. For the people of God. Take them in remembrance that Christ died for you, and feed on him in your hearts by faith and with thanksgiving.
using the prayer on page 365. Let us pray. Eternal God, Heavenly Father, you have graciously accepted us as living members of your Son, our Savior, Jesus Christ. And you have fed us with spiritual food in the sacrament of his body and blood. Send us now into the world in peace and grant us strength and courage to love and serve you with gladness and singleness of heart through Christ our Lord. Amen. May Almighty God, who has redeemed us and made us his children through the resurrection of his Son, our Lord, bestow upon you the riches of his blessing. Amen. May God, who through the water of baptism has raised us from sin into newness of life, make you holy and worthy to be united with Christ forever. Amen. May God, who has brought us out of bondage to sin into true and lasting freedom in the Redeemer, bring you to your eternal inheritance. Amen. And the blessing of God Almighty, the Father, the Son, and the Holy Spirit remain with you now and always. Amen. in the name of Christ. Alleluia, alleluia. Thanks be to God. Alleluia, alleluia.